Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, AFA's Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And uh, welcome to uh, the next uh, event in our Aerospace Nation series. Um, we're really pleased today that uh, General Terrence O'Shaughnessy uh, could join us. Uh, General O'Shaughnessy is uh, dual-hatted as the commander of U.S. Northern Command and the Binational North American Aerospace Defense Command. Mission areas under his authority include homeland defense, support to civil authorities, and aerospace warning and control in defense of North America. General O'Shaughnessy has previously served at Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe as the seventh Air Force commander in Korea and as the commander of Pacific Air Forces. Uh, Shags, welcome. Uh, it's a real privilege to have a leader with your broad experience in multiple theaters join us today. So. What I'd like to do is start off by giving you an opportunity to make a few remarks on critical challenges that are now facing your commands and uh, some of your top priorities as you look to the future. So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Let me just start by uh, appreciating your leadership at the Mitchell Institute, really important uh, as, a, as a forum in which to have great dialogues, uh, like hopefully the one we're, we're about to have. Uh, now, here at uh, North Commonorad, of course, we're knee-deep in the COVID response, but uh, I did want to talk to that in the context of our core mission set, which, of course, is uh, defending our, our homeland, and on the NORAD side, defending the U.S. and Canada and the aerospace domain. And, and really allow us to maybe look at some of the things we're doing in COVID-19 and our response there, but look at them from the broader perspective of really how we are set up as a command and as commands uh, to command and control. And that will bring us to the JADC2 discussion that I, that I hope to be able to have. So let me start, yeah, and so Dave, let me just start with, uh, you know, kind of some of the things that we've been focused on here uh, within North Common NORAD is, is really leveraging technology. Uh, one of the things that we find is um, there's a lot of things happening around the world uh, in the commercial world uh, and in the defense industrial base uh, that we haven't fully taken advantage of. And so we are literally going through a digital transformation uh, here at the headquarters. Uh, and the COVID-19 actually allowed us to advance some of the things we were doing there. Uh, and that's very much tied to the way we are approaching homeland defense and that we have to think about things a little bit differently now that we have to defend our homeland against peer adversaries. Something that frankly, in my entire career, I've really not had to worry about bringing the fight uh, back here and defending ourselves. We go all over the globe. We've, we've all been stationed all over the globe doing homeland defense mission sets around the globe, but quite a sacred responsibility to wake up every morning thinking about how do we defend our great nation at a time when our peer adversaries are actually um, looking for ways to be able to reach out and influence us uh, right here at home. And so, and so let me put uh, in perspective uh, back to the COVID-19 aspect of what we Northcom and principally Northcom have been doing uh, relative to the COVID-19 response. Uh, we were in this really right from the beginning. In fact, when um, the decision was made uh, to limit the flights coming back from Wuhan, uh, the, we were called to help HHS uh, and the Department of State uh, bring some of our citizens home. And so right from the very beginning, uh, we were part of trying to determine what's the best way to preserve um, the, the, the time and, and, and prevent the COVID-19 from getting right here at CONUS, also at the same time allowing our citizens to come home and giving them a place to go to. And so we work closely with uh, multiple bases starting off in March, uh, a reserve base, and then ultimately uh, to multiple bases across the country and we're able to bring in our citizens in coordination with HHS, uh, give them a place to be quarantined for the first 14 days, uh, be tested as they needed to be. Uh, and then uh, later we saw things like the two cruise ships where uh, we had, again, American citizens that needed a place to go. And so we were able to work uh, again with HHS and find, um, in this case, uh, several thousand rooms to be able to quarantine them and provide them the, the assistance that they needed in that time of need. Uh, simultaneously, we were working with TSA and ultimately Department of Homeland Security to look at some of the airports. And as American citizens were still allowed to travel back home, uh, of uh, setting up a system where they could be tested as they arrived. And we had 13 different airports that we had bases uh, that had freed up space that they could be quarantined in. And so as they would come in, if, if they tested uh, or had indications uh, of COVID-19, uh, then we funneled them into the bases and they were quarantined there. Uh, while they're waiting to, to recover and then ultimately uh, back to their to their home states uh, as, as they needed to go. 
Uh, that seemed, uh, at the time, uh, was our initial response and kind of our initial focus area there. But one of the things it did do is it brought us into the White House Task Force. And so we were daily in the White House Task Force sessions with the Vice President. And, and so we got some uh, insight fairly early that this was starting to grow beyond that, beyond just bringing our American citizens home. And then we started thinking about this as a, what do we need to do to defend our nation? And what are the things that we would need to do as part of the whole of America response uh, both uh, from our mission assurance standpoint to be able to continue our home and defense mission, as well as what would the military be asked to do as part of that whole of America approach. And you kind of have to bring yourself back in time because now we kind of, we, we know we flattened the curve, we know where we ended up. But at the time, we weren't exactly sure where we we're going to end up. And so some of the things we were focused on is what if this really got uh, to, to the point where we had failure in some of our basic civics uh, functions? Uh, you know, what if... Um, you know, we work the transportation that's broke down with our food networks broke down. Um, what are the things would we would be able to provide assistance again, probably not as a lead federal agency, because typically in a DISCA type role, uh, the, the Department of Defense is in support of another lead agency. So whether it be HHS or DHS uh, or FEMA. Um, and so that's what we found ourselves thinking about, you know, could we provide air traffic controllers if FAA had trouble? And so we were what ifing everything you can imagine. Uh, so that we would be postured and prepared to, to be able to do what our nation needed us to do. Now, uh, um, as bad as it, it is right now, it's a lot uh, better than we thought it might be. And so as we look at that flattening of the curve and the ability um, for our nation to, to really have the capacity to handle the problem set as it came in, uh, we were now focused on the medical aspect. And so we were looking across our nation and say, what medical capability and capacity could we bring forward? And so we work closely with the services and closely with the joint staff to determine what medical capacity could we make available to HHS. And then the decision was made to do everything through FEMA, which was a fantastic call. Because if you think about all the things we do, uh, whether it's a hurricane response, a wildfire response, we have a structure of which we are very accustomed to using. And it allows us to do the prioritization. It allows us to determine how do we best apply federal capability and capacity to a problem uh, within a state, within a local community. And the way we do that is through the National uh, Response Coordination Center or through FEMA. Uh, and so that was a great decision. And then we immediately were, were right in the battle rhythm uh, with FEMA to determine what is the support that we would uh, be able to provide. Uh, and of course, FEMA doing that on behalf of HHS in response to HHS demand signal. And so what we did is we put together what we thought at the time would be the best approach. And so that started with bringing in the relief uh, for the states in the form of the non-COVID treatment, right? If you think about that, the Corps of Engineers was out there, uh, went out and built some, some structures uh, within convention centers that had beds. Um, they weren't truly hospitals by any means, but they were able to accommodate uh, maybe either recovering uh, um, patients or patients that didn't have COVID-19. Uh, we had the comfort, we had the mercy on each coast that were being available. And the thought was we could take all those high-end trauma victims, the automobile accidents, the shootings, the gun, the, the stabbings, the, all those kind of things that would normally be in a hospital and taking some of the capacity from the ICUs and the emergency rooms, and we could take them uh, on the comfort and the mercy. So amazing work by the United States Navy to get both those ships ready, especially the comfort, which was supposed to be down for maintenance for a long period of time. And we got her sailing to, um, uh, to New York City. And then when she arrived in New York City, one of the things we found very quickly was because people were really abiding by what the local officials had asked them to do, which was to stay at home, uh, we actually found that there weren't car accidents, there weren't the stabbings, there weren't the gunshots that we would normally see in that kind of an environment. And so we were very quickly um, sensing and seeing what we needed to do and, and determining that we needed to adjust our fire. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we were able to do that. Uh, really through technology was a big part of us uh, being able to adjust very quickly. But we adjusted and, and very quickly we started accepting COVID patients on the comfort, which is no small uh, feat. If you think about all the challenges that we've had on the cruise ships, well, uh, you know, the comfort is essentially, you know, it's a very similar in, in the way it's set up to a cruise ship but, uh, from the aspect of it's hard to get separation uh, on a ship uh, if you're trying to treat that many patients. So the Navy uh, team did a fantastic job of being able to set up some, some COVID areas and some non-COVID areas to separate the patients and the crew appropriately and started treating those high acuity patients uh, on the comfort uh, and, and, and ended up treating a, a rel uh, 182 uh, patients, all high end, uh, both COVID and non-COVID, about 75% of them ended up being COVID positive. 
Simultaneous to that, we set up the Javits Center, which originally was set up by the Corps of Engineers just to be a kind of a convalescing area. But what we found quickly, again, was we needed to be able to bring COVID patients in. One of the challenges we found with COVID patients is they very quickly go from just convalescing to very, very uh, high need uh, medical attention. And, and that can happen very quickly from one to the other. And so we actually found we needed to bring the, the Javits Center up to a much higher level of, of acuity and care that they could be able to provide. And so we had an army uh, hospital that had uh, deployed there. Fortunately, we had deployed it with this entire equipment set. So we essentially had a hospital box and we were able to take that hospital box and bring it in the convention center, bring in the ICU beds, bring in the oxygen, bring in the pharmacy, bring in all those things that you need to be able to do the higher end, the ICU level patients. Uh, and that now allowed the, um, the ability for us to now use the Javits Center in a, in a much more effective way. And then as we found, we actually found that we were right. We, the, they were kind of tapering off in the capacity that the hospitals had. And so one of the things that we thought um, we might be able to do is provide some of these doctors and nurses and techs that we had and bring them right into the hospitals. Because what we found was it within the hospitals, as the number of ICU beds that you have within a hospital increases, so does your staff manning requirements. And so for the same number of beds, but with a higher acuity care, you need many more uh, uh, medical um, uh, uh, officials to be able to help out, as well as a lot of attrition, right? We, the, the New York City health officials, amazing work that they were doing. But some of them were down for the count, right? Some of them um, were just working for months straight and needed a break. Some of them were came up with COVID virus themselves. Uh, and so we found we could start pushing uh, some teams forward. And so we were able to do that initially with 325 augmentees. And now I'll, I'll circle back to, to one of the success stories that we found was, okay, we're, we're gonna now take 325 individual augmentees from the Navy, United States Air Force, and we're gonna push them to 11 hospitals in the middle of New York City. And that is not something we, the military, are used to doing, right? We, we, we deploy as a unit, right? We, we go in as a unit, we fight as a unit, uh, and then we come home as a, a unit. And so this was a very uh, daunting for a commander that was then gonna be responsible for these 325 doctors and nurses. I was concerned about how are we gonna control them? How are we gonna keep in touch with them? How are we gonna make sure they have the right PPE? How are we gonna make sure that they're doing all right? They're in, a, they're in the hostile environment, right? They're fighting the COVID. And they're right in, they're, they ran to the sound of gunfire and they're right there amongst the, the COVID uh, in the worst place in our entire country. Um, and so one of the things we did is we, we, we went back to our, to our technology efforts that we were doing. And I uh, recently received a call from uh, the vice president of Apple, Doug Beck, and, and his message to me was, hey, what do you need? We, we're here to help you. We know you've got some things going on already. What can we do to provide some help and assistance? And so we leveraged that help from Apple and what we were able to take um, um, some of the work we had done on the JADC2 side, applied to this, and we actually uh, were able to make apps for the Apple devices, uh, give them to the 325 deployers. And so what, when they went to the hospitals, and by the way, we did this in less than 48 hours, um, we were able to take all these devices, put the apps on them, deploy them out to the, to the deployers so that when they when I went, I could track them real time. I knew exactly where they're at. Uh, twice a day, they would fill out, uh, tell me how they're doing. Uh, both mentally and physically, because remember, this is a pretty, you know, this is a combat zone, right? In, this, in the sense of what they're being um, uh, asked to deal with. And so how you do it mentally, right, is, is, is as important as how you do it physically, obviously, in this department. You have the right PPE. Um, and then we were able to uh, leverage that to then, uh, every day I'd, I'd get a team of them together and I'd just say, how you doing? What are you seeing? What, how, what, what's actually happening at the battlefield? And so that just shrunk that you think about the C2, that that just went from, you know, five, six, 10 people between myself and the doctors to instantly understanding exactly what was sensing, what was happening on the front lines uh, at the battlefield. And so with that there, we were actually able to adjust fire. We were able to adjust the way we were doing, uh, applying it. And now, like today, we have 731 doctors and nurses um, in those same hospitals. But in addition to that, we're in 24 different hospitals all across the nation. As, as the demand signal has now increased in other places, we were able to take that model and then apply it uh, across uh, the battlefield, if you will, from the national perspective and apply that right there. And the real reason we we're able to, to understand that and do that uh, was because of our ability to, to, to see what would sense what was happening in the front line. And if you think about what you wanna do from a bigger fight, from a home on defense fight, from a fight over in the Pacific, uh, that's exactly what you wanna be able to do, right? You wanna sense the battlefield, you wanna get the information right to the decision makers, and you wanna, at the speed of relevance, you wanna be able to make decisions to adjust fire. Uh, let me go back to the decision to go from non-COVID to COVID. 
One of the things that we also did with working with companies like Esri um, and Apple and Moncton as we worked these apps uh, was to do some predictive analysis. And the first thing in predictive analysis, you got to understand the data, right? What we found was that data wasn't at all that it uh, was touted to be. And so you look at you look at the hospital numbers, you look at the bed capacity, you look at all that, a lot of data floating around, but we really had to get to understand the fidelity of that data. And so our team worked really hard with Esri to understand that. But once we had that, then we were able to really see, was the curve really being flattened? And because we had some of that and be able to predict now into the future, we could say that, you know what, we don't need to set up another convention center. We need to push the forward because we now know that the curve is flattened the hospitals have the capacity, that's the best way to push our, our healthcare forward. So it was relatively easy for me to make a decision um, at the speed of relevance when, frankly, if we didn't have that information, it probably would have been four, five, six days later that we would have made that same decision and that would have cost lives. It was that important for us to get that there forward. And, and the reason we were able to do that was the accumulation of the uh, forward sensing, uh, the having that data available, having that predictive analysis, and having it all brought up to the command level uh, so we can make those uh, those decisions. And, and, and that's exactly what we want to do uh, on the Homeland Defense mission set. And frankly, that's what we want to do as a Department of Defense as we employ the force uh, all over the globe. And so I can use that as my, my transition over to JADC too, because uh, that's, uh, you know, I'm really passionate about the great work that our team has been doing on the COVID response. And I'm equally as passionate about JADC too and how important that is to our future as a Department of Defense. And as we really looked at what is our competitive advantage going to be going into the future against these peer adversaries that we see always increasing their capability and capacity. And to me, that, that, that core thing that we're going to be able to do, that we will be able to maintain that competitive advantage, uh, it's going to be on our decision superiority. But we can't have decision superiority if we don't have all the JADC2 mechanisms in place that allow you um, to do that. And so let me uh, quickly go through just a couple of the things that we've been doing here at NORTHCOM and NORAD uh, with respect to JADC2. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I found is that I've been doing joint work here for about 10 years now. Almost all my jobs, uh, even my Air Force jobs, have been very much joint uh, related in the sense of, you know, as a PACAF commander, I'm really the Joint Force Air Component Commander for PACOM, so it's really a joint job unto itself. So pretty much every job I've had in the last decade has been joint. So one of the things we saw is the Air Force was working through ABMS, the Air Force was given the lead as an executive agent for JADC2, is, we thought we NORTHCOM could put the J in JADC2 and we could help the service uh, as they were working uh, all the things that they needed to do internal to the Air Force, we could help them with the J, uh, the joint perspective of that. And so we volunteered to, to uh, partner with the Air Force uh, on the, uh, some of the experiments that they were doing. And the first one we did was in December uh, and we did the uh, uh, JAD, or ABMS uh, experiment number one in Eglin. Uh, it was a, a very successful uh, attempt to try to get all those great PowerPoint slides that we have and how do we actually make those lightning bolts real, right? Instead of having just a lightning bolt and a PowerPoint slide, how do we actually go show that we can actually do this? Um, I applaud the, uh, the, the uh, attitude of the Air Force to be able to fail fast. Uh, part of this was being able to put this together relatively quickly, knowing that we wouldn't have uh, perfection, uh, but knowing that we're going to learn as we did that. And so as we partnered with them, we were able to take a home and defense scenario of, a, of cruise missiles coming in, maintaining custody of those cruise missiles, and ultimately uh, being able to hand them off. Uh, we had uh, Aegis destroyers from the Navy helping us out. We had F-35s from the Air Force and the Navy, F-22s, of course, from the Air Force. Uh, but we also had uh, HIMARS uh, on the, uh, from our Army brethren. Um, and we were able to tie in things like um, our pro proliferated LEO, uh, work that we've been doing to, to really kind of tie that into the ability to bring these things together in real time. Uh, we, we were able to take real uh, data and push it to an airborne C-130 using the proliferated LEO uh, concept and show the value of that and how critically important it is. And then we're able to fuse all this information in ways that uh, we see on PowerPoint slides but we're not actually uh, used to doing on a regular routine basis. Now, what, again, we, it wasn't uh, wasn't perfect, uh, and it, it had some uh, challenges in it. But it was amazing to see in the DevOps environment when you get the companies in there that know that they they don't have to bring the perfect solution, but they can bring something that can actually uh, add value to the overall situation. And, and then you put them together, and you put them together where they can actually develop uh, that as they're operating it in the DevOps uh, mindset. It's amazing. It's just in a in a in a couple days time, literally, because. Most of the things were kind of coming in play about 48 hours prior. 
and we had a lot of red on the slide. We kind of green, yellow, red uh, dots on how it was going to work. A lot of red, but by the time we executed, it was almost all green. Uh, and that's a testament to the folks that were out there making that happen. So we signed up for experiment number two as well from Northcom, and, and we're, we're just now expanding this uh, drastically. We were hoping to execute it right now, but unfortunately with the COVID environment, we had to delay it until the late August, probably early September uh, timeframe. Uh, but we're still super excited about it. We're going to do the same thing, but just take it in an even broader perspective. And I'm uh, happy to talk about that if anyone has questions on that um, going into, into the future. But as, as we look at JADC2 from us in the home end defense mindset, we see JADC2 is absolutely core to the way we're going to defend the home end. And so I, I kind of keep things a little bit simple. Uh, what, what I think we need to defend the home end is first thing we need is we need domain awareness, right? We need to know from undersea, uh, all the way up to space, we need to know everything that's happening within our sovereign territory and the approaches to our sovereign territory. And we need that domain awareness in ways that we haven't done it in the past. Um, and we need to do it, it, it much further out than we've had to do in the past based on our peer adversaries uh, really increasing their capability. Uh, and then JADC2 is what brings all of those sensors and brings it all together. And then we need defeat mechanisms and we got to flip the cost curve on those defeat mechanisms, right? We can't spend a million, $10 million a shot uh, to defeat inbound missiles. We got to figure out how do we do that cheaper. And then, as I mentioned, core to that is the JADC2. And the one aspect I do want to mention, and maybe we can talk more about it in the questions, is you know, we tend to talk about JADC2 talking about how we're able to take sensors, tie them into shooters. And that is an incredibly important part of that. And I've kind of gone through a lot of different iterations of that in my own mind uh, of how is it, you know, any sensor to, to any shooter or is it, is it uh, any sensor to best shooter and all those kind of iterations that you go through. But to me, that's only a piece of what we're trying to do with JADC2. And the part that I think is going to be so incredibly game-changing is the ability for us to, to really use the predictive analysis and inform our decisions going into the future. One of the things I, I use as an example of this is if someone was to call my command center right this moment and, and something was happening and we had to respond to it, uh, what would happen is I have, a, I have a bunch of 06s down there that have 25, 30 years of experience. Right? And they're going to pick up the phone or they're going to see something happening on the screen and going to go, okay, we need to do something. And they're going to be informed by what's between their two years, right? 30 years of experience, 25 years of experience. And they're going to go, okay, based on this, I need to do that. I think we can do better than that. I think we can do a lot better than that, matter of fact. Uh, and what we ought to be thinking about is how do we have all those sensors feeding in and infusing together? But then how do we actually have some predictive analysis that takes all the information, doesn't just give you a great understanding of what we have right this minute, but what is likely to happen in the future, and then inform that decision maker with COAs that are then informed with what's the ramification of each of the COAs you take. You know, you can watch that, but if you launch that tanker, now it's not going to be available for this mission, three, three iterations down the road that you need to think about. And so that's to me what JADC2 is going to bring. It's going to inform our decision makers it's going to help them make decisions that are playing chess, are thinking about two or three moves downstream, and are going to give the decision makers at the speed of relevance the ability to make really complex decisions based on the information that we have that's rock solid, and then maybe something that's less solid but is predictive in nature based on what we've seen uh, in running in our models, running in our simulations, and what we have seen the adversary do in the past. And to me, that's the exciting part of JADC2 that will be uh, entirely game-changing. Uh, so um, let me just uh, kind of wrap up there and just say we at North Carolina NORAD, we're super excited uh, about uh, where we are with, uh, with JADC2. Uh, we think there's a long way to go. We think we can help with the J in JADC2. Uh, and then on the COVID-19, I could not be prouder of the team and all the support that they provide across our great nation in our nation's time of need um, and uh, applied it right exactly where it needs to be with exactly what uh, the adjustments that needed to be done at the speed of relevance. So with that, let me uh, turn it back to you, Dave. Okay, thanks very much, General, for those uh, incredible insights to uh, both how uh, you've uh, led and your team uh, has uh, dealt with the COVID-19 challenge, as well as integrating a thoughtful perspective and incorporation of technology into not just today's uh, challenges, but also planning for the future. So. So please pass our uh, thanks to all the men and women of uh, North, Northcom and uh, NORAD uh, who perform our highest priority mission, and that's defending our homeland. Um, now, you, you've covered lots of issues on uh, COVID and a bit about uh, joint all-domain command and control. So let's move up north for a bit. 
Um, in the past, you said that the Arctic is the U.S. homeland's frontliner defense. And given that Russia is projecting military power into the region and is building Arctic bases to support its operations, and China's made no secret uh, that it aspires to become a polar power, um, what are some of your top priorities for this front line of defense? Yeah, well, thanks for bringing that up because that is near and dear to our ability to defend our homeland. And I do see that as an avenue of approach um, that we have to invest in. And the way I see it now is we have a couple uh, particular areas that we can invest in. First, you know, we have to be able to operate in that environment. And the only way you can operate in that environment is you have to go train in that. Um, and one of the things we find is, you know, we can deploy uh, a Department of Defense military personnel all over the world. And I can pretty much take any unit and deploy it almost anywhere in the world. And, and they're going to do really well. Uh, the one area of the world that you can't do that is if you haven't been in the Arctic, if you haven't trained in the Arctic, if you don't have the right kit, the right gear, uh, the right ability uh, and understanding how you operate in that environment, you are not going to be successful in your operations there. We learned that in World War II. Um, we, 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 we have to uh, find a way to get the team out there exercising, and practicing. And we, I'm, I'm really actually pleased with the services. Are, I've realized that we see a much uh, greater increase in our ability to train uh, in the Arctic. And we see things uh, like Jay Park Range, so critically important that we have to continue to invest in there. So we have the, the places to, to train in that environment. Uh, and then we have to be able to communicate. One of the things we find is uh, after you get above about 65 degrees uh, or so north, uh, some of our traditional means of communication really start breaking down. And once you get, once you get closer to 70, almost all except for our most exquisite uh, com communication capability really starts to break down. And so we see a need to, to, to re-look at our ability to communicate in the Arctic. I think the, one of the best approaches in there or part of the solution set is going to be the proliferation of WEO. Uh, you look at all that that will bring you uh, in a in very near term. Um, if you look at uh, some of the companies out there doing incredible things, uh, we see that as a, a solution set to allow us to communicate uh, in the Arctic uh, it, it, in the relative near future. And that will be uh, critical, uh, I think, as we as we move forward. Um, and then the um, uh, the third part of that is infrastructure. You know, we we got to we have to be able to to have places to operate from. And if you know, we, we look at what Russia's doing, um, and you, they're clearly investing in infrastructure. Um, so we need to we need to have places that we can operate out of. Uh, it's great to see some of the uh, additional forces that are going in, whether it be the F 35s going into Isleson. Uh, whether, uh, whether we see the, the work of the Coast Guard to develop uh, icebreakers, uh, these are all relevant things for us to be able to uh, operate uh, in, the, in the Arctic. Uh, and, that, and that is absolutely, to me, key to our ability to defend ourselves is we have to be able to, uh, to operate there. We have to be able to communicate. And then we have to be able to see uh, what's happening in the Arctic. So it goes right back to those three buckets, the domain awareness part of that. And so we have to continue to work on our ability to see the approaches to our homeland uh, and understand what is uh, what is there uh, and be able to react to it. Uh, um, so I take it, uh, or, or let me get your perspective on this. I mean, I'm, I, I'm sure you are uh, incorporating uh, long range uh, unmanned aerial vehicles like uh, Global Hawk uh, and other future unmanned systems uh, stationed at uh, US Northern Tier bases. Is that one of the areas you're looking into extend the range of uh, NORAD situational awareness? Dave, I think it's a it's a multitude of different things, and that's the way that we're, we're approaching things that might be a little bit different. Is we're not looking at stovepipe solution sets anymore. When we look at the domain awareness aspect of this, we're looking for all the sensors that could come together, uh, all the way from literally our undersea and our IUSS systems that we have from the United States Navy uh, that can contribute to other ways than just undersea, uh, all the way up to, um, to 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 space. And between those are things like you're talking about, and what are the things we could do with that persistent. Uh, ability to to sense, um, and it, it could be from our traditional uh, long uh, long endurance ISR. It could be using balloons. It could be space. It could be um, the proliferated Leo. Uh, it's a combination of all that that we have to look together, and then they have to work together, right? They can't they can't just be part of a stovepipe system. They have to provide domain awareness across the board, and they all can contribute. But in the end, you have to fuse it all together, which then brings you right back to what. JADC2, because JADC2 is going to be the key that's going to bring that all together, whether it's the long endurance UAVs, whether it's the near space, uh, whether it, it's the Porfre Leo, uh, or whether it's uh, terrestrial based radars. We've got to be able to bring it together. And we think, so my, my, my short answer to you is yes, uh, but it's only part of a much uh, bigger ecosystem that we have to put together for sensing. 
Um, right. And uh, I, it's it's just as someone who's been an advocate of uh, building that kind of a uh, integrated complex, it's a uh, Wonderful to see everything that you're doing and the approach that you're taking. Um, now, you've also spoken about the growing threat of uh, missile attacks on North America, not just from ballistic missiles uh, launched by rogue states, but also long range cruise missile and even uh, potential hypersonic weapon attacks that could come from the sea uh, or through the Arctic Avenue of approach. What are some of the more promising concepts and capabilities uh, for dealing with this growing threat? And What's your most immediate priority for homeland missile defense? Yeah, probably not surprising to you, but we're right back down to the first thing is we need domain awareness, right? Because you have to see them coming. And and they're very different challenges, but they're actually very similar challenges. And one of the things that we've done in the past is, for example, on ballistic missile defense, we have a, a network of sensors that give us the ability to track that initial launch. And then once we have burnout, then because it's ballistic, right, it, you now know the trajectory and you know where it's going. Well, the hypersonic, that... Uh, or excuse me, on the uh, hyperglide vehicles, that is no longer the case because now, even though it, it may may look initially like a like a ballistic missile, once it's uh, once it's actually uh, past its initial burn, then it comes down. Uh, it's it, it is now maneuverable, and so you now have to keep custody of that weapon system all the way through from from launch to uh, uh, to intercept, and so that completely changes the the, the nature of the problem set. And then the same thing with the hypersonic cruise missiles and the same thing with the cruise missiles is you now, because of the lower RCS, some of our traditional um, terrestrial based radars may be challenged to keep track of that at the distances that are at, that we can use at relevance. And so to me, it goes the way that you, you don't go after cruise missiles and then you don't go after hypersonics and you don't go after hypersonic glide vehicles. You actually go after all of them together. And so it goes right back to that same ecosystem that we need to have that domain awareness. And then once you have that domain awareness, of course, you have the JADC2 that we're talking about that you can be able to react with a speed of relevance. But then we, we really do have to work on our kill mechanisms. And, and to me, that's, uh, that's probably the, I think, we're, I, th I think the domain awareness we're getting close on. Uh, I think the JADC2 we're making some significant progress on. The area that we need to, to continue to look at is those defeat mechanisms. How can we flip that cost curve? And it's directed energy, right? It's it's the it's the new it's new ways to actually uh, defeat things, not just directed energy, but just things like direct energy. That because what that does allows you to have a high rate of fire, a deep magazine, uh, and be able to take on multiple threats. Uh, so those kinds of things, uh, or, or whether it be like the hit to kill on a paladin type gun that you could actually hit to kill a missile on, uh, or or other things that we could do to take out those missiles. Um, and though, to me, those solution sets that we're actually getting closer to, but you think about, you know, direct energy, we've been five years away in direct energy for a long time. Uh, and so we actually have to bring those to fruition, right? We have to take this technology that's out there. How do we bring it to fruition and actually have it uh, relevant uh, to the warfighter to be able to, to use that to defend ourselves? And frankly, the things that we're looking at in the homeland are trying to get away from uh, traditionally what we've done is we, we look at uh, what what systems are out there and go, how can we apply that to homeland defense? You know, how can you take an F-15 and apply that to homeland defense? How can you take a, 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 a Patriot and apply it to homeland defense? I think we have to get out of that mindset and really start thinking about what's the purpose built capability capacity? Because I don't need a Patriot, right? I, I don't need it to be cam bio hard to, to maneuver at the, the rate of a BCT. I just, you know, I can just park it somewhere or I can build it somewhere and just leave it there. Um, and, and same as the radars and everything else. So to me, we, we ought to take the technology from all those things, but we ought to apply it in a purpose-built way that will allow you to do it at, a, at an affordable rate uh, while still uh, using some of the, the things that we are traditionally using. Uh, but what I find is as soon as, we, as soon as we exercise this, the very things that Phil Davidson needs as the commander of Indo-PACOM are the very things that, that, that Todd Walters would need as the, the, the SAC here are the same things that I would need, right? You need fighters, you need AWACS, you need, you need all the, the tankers, you need all the same things. And so how do we get out of that competing for those things? And how do we build the things uh, to defend our homeland in ways that we haven't had to against a peer adversary, uh, leveraging the technology of those other devices and maybe using some of them, but we maybe uh, take some of the burden off them by having some, uh, you know, some purpose-built capability as well. Well, you've clearly laid out the case for taking an integrated approach, regardless of uh, the quote stovepipes that uh, each one of those individual elements uh, come from. Uh, but he, the proverbial problem and the and the challenges that one is, that you're very aware of is that as a 
a joint combatant commander, um, you, you really care about desired outcomes. Uh, but where are all the services and the service components and their support uh, for joint all domain command and control? There's word out there that some of the services are all not that uh, supportive and that as soon as uh, General Goldfein retires, um, they might terminate their support. So given that JADC2 is critical to the success of future joint force operations, how, how does the institution ensure DOD-wide support when its strong proponents retire? Well, I think one of it is trying to, to advocate for it in ways that help people understand the value of it. And frankly, that's part of what we've been trying to do at NORTHCOM because as we look at connecting the joint force and the importance of that, one of the things, one of our own observations was it, it's just, it's a bunch of uh, PowerPoint charts with, uh, with uh, lightning bolts and, and things on it, as opposed to go show us what it can actually do. And so I think that what the Air Force is doing with these ABMS experiments, um, I think are really going to help in the joint community to understand a little bit with a little bit more fidelity of understanding what does it bring to them? Because at the end of the day, each service is going to look at it from the service perspective as they should and what is the value to their service. And the amazing thing is when you actually break it down and whether you look at the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, uh, the Space Force, and you look at their basic C2 requirements, so they're, everybody is after the same target in my opinion. Right, like right. You actually get at, when you look at you know what they're all what everyone is trying to do, everyone's shooting on the same target. We just have to bring it together so we go together as a joint community uh, towards that solution set. And so that's part of uh, my, my intent uh, from here from Northcom is to really show the value to the joint force uh, of what JADC2 can bring. Uh, and we 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 do have some some pretty good. Um, uh, advocate advocation that we see not just in the Air Force, but growingly in some of the other services. Well, but I will tell you, we're not done. I mean, th this is uh, where there's work yet to be done to truly get the foundation of support that we need in order to keep JADC2 moving forward. Now, um, you, clearly, your one of your key responsibilities is defense of North America's uh, airspace, uh, and uh, it, it's uh, very well known that China and Russia are developing more advanced and long range uh, sensors and air to air weapons and uh, offensively capable aircraft. Given this trend line, what are your thoughts uh, concerning the need for additional fifth generation fighters to defend our sovereign airspace? And uh, uh, are, are the fourth generation capabilities still ones that are needed against this evolving threat? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. And, and you know, clearly, if you gave me a choice of a fifth gen or a you know, fourth gen, we, we, we take the, the fifth gen, and not only because of uh, the, the capability that it has uh, inherently as a, as a fifth gen, but its ability to fuse all the information um, that we see in you know, F-35, F-22 that we don't necessarily see in some of the fourth gen legacy platforms. Uh, that said, I do see there's a, there's, there's a way to integrate them together to leverage the goodness of the fifth gen while taking maybe some of the advanced fourth gen capability forward. And so I, I'd use the, you know, the F-15X as an example of that, where, you know, it's going to bring some really important uh, capability that we could use from the home and defense perspective in the in the range that it brings and the payload that it brings. Uh, and, and obviously it has some advanced avionics uh, within it. And when you couple that with the fifth gen capability, I do see some some use of it, but you know, again, if you know, everything else be equal, um, especially against peer adversaries, and, and frankly, I'd have a different answer for me if you asked me from my uh, from my old PACAF days. Um, you know, the the fifth gen uh, capability in the in that fight uh, is is clearly uh, we have to leverage the fifth gen capability for survivability to have the desired effect. Now let's switch gears a little bit. In 2010, Northcom made a major step toward building a closer relationship with uh, Mexico's military to deal with a range of issues such as counter narcotics and counter human trafficking. Um, a decade later, how's this uh, relationship proceeding? It's really strong. And, and I, I'm actually um, talking to my counterparts there from Sedana and Samar on a regular routine basis. Uh, we've, we do a, quite a bit of interaction uh, on the missions that you mentioned, for example, on the counter-narcotics, the immigration aspect as well, uh, and some of the role that we have on the border and some of the role that they have within their uh, country. Uh, it's been an interesting time for Mexico um, as we see uh, some of the challenges that they're faced with and as they uh, build up a National Guard, which is very, very different than our National Guard, so um, not to be confused uh, with our model. Um, the Sedena in particular, and to some degree, Samara has contributed force to that. Uh, and, and this transition has been an interesting time 
uh, as they do work that internal to their nation. Um, but we, we find that our counterparts, um, they, they want to engage with us. They want to do things with us. They're great partners. Um, they're always advancing uh, their capability and capacity. Um, and and we, we do a lot of things under the radar sometimes, uh, but we engage on a regular routine basis, uh, and they are great partners. Now, General, you mentioned at the very beginning that you've served a, a good portion of your career uh, in a variety of joint and service jobs around the world. Based on your experiences, what's your advice to airmen specifically in regard to working within a joint force operational environment? Yeah, the first thing I would say is uh, be an unabashed airman. And what I mean by that, be proud of, uh, of what we are, what we bring to the fight and our heritage. Uh, that said, uh, you have to understand the joint force to really understand what can we contribute to that joint force. And so one of the things that I find is you know, really that as you have an opportunity to engage with the joint partners is really try to understand their capabilities uh, almost to the same level you understand your own um, and, and figure out um, how can you contribute to that joint force. And I find that the best officers that I see uh, aren't just stuck in their own lane of, you know, air domain as an example, but they broaden out, they understand the bigger picture, and then they can better advocate for um, air power in this case uh, because of their understanding of the broader joint force perspective. So to my to my uh, fellow airmen out there, I just say I continue to be uh, very passionate uh, about being an airman, but understand the joint fight, invest your own time uh, to understand uh, the joint community uh, how they operate, and you, then you can better understand how we need to operate in coordination. Well, General Shaughnessy, thanks very much uh, for your comments on these uh, critical uh, issues. I think uh, that last one, you really drove home the point. People tend to forget that uh, when you're in a service position, uh, advocating for what your service can bring to the joint fight is being as joint as you can be. Uh, so thanks for that. And on behalf of the Mitchell Institute, uh, for aerospace studies and all of AFA. We wish you the very best as you continue to deal with challenges that affect uh, the security and well-being of each and every American. Let's wrap this up and I very much appreciate and our audience does too, you taking the time to share with us uh, the, the great work that the men and women of uh, uh, NORTHCOM and NORAD uh, are doing. So keep up the great work and have a super aerospace power kind of day. Well, thank you, Dave. Proud to serve here at uh, North Common NORAD with an amazing team that uh, has the watch to defend our great nation. Amen. Take care, Shags. Best of luck. Thanks, Dave. Bye-bye.